Best Book Bits podcast brings you Jackie Stavros and Sherry Torres, author of the book, Conversations Worth Having, Using Appreciative Inquiry to Fuel Productivity and Meaningful Engagement. Ladies, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having us. I'll start with you, uh, Sherry. Tell us a little bit of your background and story and how you two came to be co-authors together. Sure. Um, I guess my background, to, I'm, I'm going to make a very long story short, is that I have always been um, interested and focused on how to maximize the potential of any individual, how do you maximize your own potential, and then translating that into teams and organizations. How do you, um, how do you really unleash the full potential? And... Um, when I happened to learn about appreciative inquiry back in the late 90s, it was kind of a perfect fit with my temperament, which is to look for what's possible. What, what can we do? How can we jump with both feet and then figure out um, where we've landed? Um, and it, but appreciative inquiry was all about organizational change, organizational design. And I met Jackie in the early 2000s, and both she and I were in Appreciative Inquiry and both wanted to bring Appreciative Inquiry to the general public as a way of being able to support, you know, living your best life, living your best self, and being able to um, strengthen relationships and achieve success. And we wrote one book together in 2005, that was Dynamic Relationships. But when we went to do a second edition, um, we weren't in the same place and we had kind of moved in terms of how to bring appreciative inquiry into the general public. And in 2018, we published Conversations Worth Having together um, and with great gratitude for our um, editor, Steve Parasante, he kept saying, we really want to publish a book for the general public, and you can only have one or two practices at most. Um, so he really forced us to simplify this practice. And by the time we finished the book and started to work with it, we what we really got was the way to unleash the potential of both yourself, your relationships and organizations is all through your conversations. Um, yeah, wow. Well, yeah. Yeah. We'll jump into the book uh, very shortly, but yeah, thank you for unpacking uh, the story and how that unfolded. And yourself, Jackie, um, tell us a little bit about your background uh, story and, and how you sort of met uh, Sherry back in the day. Yeah, so um, my be my brief background, I would say, in a couple sentences is um, I grew up in the marketing, branding, international business development area. I was in high tech, automotive, and about twenty five years ago, I had a CEO that said, um, "You know, you're really good at." your discipline, marketing, and branding, and you've got a lot to learn about the human side of organizational life. And so I stumbled upon Appreciative Inquiry at Case Western Reserve University, where it was created in 1995, and there was this principle called social construction, and it said, our words create our reality. And so that's kind of led me to the journey. And and shortly after um, working on my doctorate, I met Sherry and everything she said, exactly, I, I just echo it. And what became crystal clear to us after our editor said, you know, it's it's all about the conversations and how we could bring appreciative inquiry, you know, into everyday life so that people are productive, they're engaged. And just working with Sherry on this, it, a book really, this book really changed my whole life and how important conversations are to everyday living. Yeah, th thank you for sharing that. And yeah, some of the notes I got, I got from the book straight up, we'll jump into it, was, you know, sometimes the greatest adventure is simply a conversation. That's a, a quote at the start. And another one I love, which is we live in a world, we live in worlds our conversations create. And I, I really think that's true. Uh, and this is one of the reasons I do the podcast as well. I don't know what I'm about to learn. I don't know what you're about to say. And my audience doesn't know what they're about to listen to as well. So jumping into it, uh, let's talk about, and I'll ask this question 
either you can answer or you both can, uh, tuning in. Um, tuning in allows us for self and others awareness, giving you the choice to be intentional with your conversation, asking generative questions and using positive framing f- fosters conversations worth having. Can you talk a little bit about tuning in? Yeah. Um, so our, our new book, that's what pushed us into a whole new chapter is Um, you know, what's driving, you're driving your conversations and that it is so important before you do these, these two practices of generative questions and positive framing, how do you tune in? And that's really um, a deep listening to the question, where am I? And where am I is, it's your body mindset. Um, If you drew a straight line, you tune in, Are you above the line and above the line? Is that appreciative space, appreciative conversations? Or you, you know, think about when you fall below the line into that depreciative state. And so you usually can feel it in your body or your mind when you're below the line in a bad place. Um, And you kind of also know when you've got all that energy and you're above the line in that appreciative space. And we have this technique that should be familiar to some, but the tuning in is to tell you to just pause because it's resetting your body chemistry. Pause, take a deep breath and get curious as to where, where am I before you're entering conversations. Is there anything you want to add on that, uh, Sherry? Yes. If I could just add, um, uh, if, if you're listening to this podcast, uh, Just think about the last time you were in a conversation where you just reacted because you either got defensive or you were really stressed. Um, And ask yourself, who or what was driving that conversation? Was it dehydration? Was it lack of sleep? Was was it the fact that I I forgot to have lunch? Or, Or was it a bias? I was anticipating something from the person and sure enough, I saw it. Um, And so the, the whole act of tuning in is to be able to stop for a moment, pause, and just check in so that you can actually be intentional and conscious about how you engage in conversations. Instead of being kind of driven by all those unconscious things that create our worldview and cause us to respond when we're not paying attention to the fact that our conversations influence everything in our lives. Yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah, for for you and Jackie, I, I got some notes out of that. So basically, we spend so much of our time being unintentional with our conversations and we, we never pause, we never breathe, we never reset and we're always going into conversations with what's in it for me instead of stopping to say, okay, who is who is in the driver's seat and what not what I want to get out of these conversations but how do I want to interact in this particular conversation as well. Um, it's a very interesting dynamic as well and segueing into your uh, next uh, element, uh, you talk about generative questions. What is is generative questions and and yeah talk, talk a little bit about that so if you um think about the the way you see the world I mean, we all kind of have a world view we look through that it's a mindset it includes our belief systems our biases whatever kind of education and training we have the job we have so we look through this lens of our world um and We often judge people and we see people in a particular way. And a generative question actually widens the screen for us. It helps us take in more information. And there are usually four different kinds of generative questions. One kind is to make the invisible visible. So I might say to you, what are are your assumptions? Or can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by what you just said? What perspective do you have on this? Those would all be making the invisible visible. Um, Another uh, outcome from generative questions is to create shared understanding. In a group of people, you might ask each person, you know, what knowledge do you bring to this? What data do you bring? What information do you have that I don't have? Um, until you get to the point where everybody has shared information and possibly a shared um, vision of where they want to go. The third thing is generating new knowledge. 
And that uh, might be in the course of our conversation. I might say to you, well, how did you do this? This is like the third podcast you've run, Michael. How did you do this in the first podcast? You know, with for a different company. Or I might say to Jackie, when you worked um, at a different university, how did they do it there? So it's generating new knowledge into the conversation. And then the last one is inspiring possibility. What if... You know, how might we? Those questions that say, let's like, if, if we were starting over from scratch, how would we design this? Um, it's that uh, if you could do anything, what would you do? Imagine this future, the future you want. How could you get there? Um, so the, a generative question, actually, it expands the field of possibility and potential for relationships, people, and organizations. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And Jackie, is there anything you want to add on to that? Or? Just two things. Um, the first thing is um, in our workplaces and even in our families, our communities, these types of conversations, um, we, we've seen it, we've heard it, there's signs, it fuels productivity, performance, engagement, um, and it really supports excellence in a thriving culture. And, and the other thing I would love the listeners to think about is, you know, people will tell you what they don't want, what they don't like. And, and when you pause, breathe, and get curious, I could say, you know, so, Michael, tell me what you do want. What are your wishes? And that generative question is I'm leaning in. I'm really curious of understanding why do you think that way? So it doesn't ignore the problems, but it begins to take you in a different direction and to understand what you're thinking is, what your wishes are. How do you see it? You know, who other, who else should we have in this conversation? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you for uh, sharing that. And I'll just go over some of the notes I took from that. So uh, with Sherry, you talked about, you know, make the invisible visible. And I think that's really important to, you know, call out things that other people don't see or uh, which is really good. Create shared understanding and vision. Definitely that's a, a great generative uh, question. Generating new knowledge. Um one of my notes is, you know, questions are, are keys that unlock people. It's not what we know that matters. It's how do we ask the right question to the right person that's going to unlock new knowledge in them and actually create that shared understanding. Uh, there was a quote on a, a gentleman I heard many years ago said, everyone might have the same answer, but what makes us unique is the questions we ask. And I think having that as an, in, as an intention of, hang on a sec, if I ask the right question at the right time, I can not only get shared knowledge, shared vision, but, but new knowledge as well, and let that person get a better understanding of themselves too by just asking that right question. Um, I think most of the time we just go around, as I said, unintentionally, and we ask the same old question. So what did you have for dinner last night? What did you watch on TV? How was your day today? Was it good or was it bad? But not really going deeper than the surface level questions. And then the other one was inspiring possibility. Um, but yeah, I really like what you said, Jackie, which was lean in and, and be curious uh, as well. Really, really good stuff. Moving on, um, you talk about in the book the nature of conversations and you do a good little image and graph there and you talk about sort of appreciative conversations versus just, um, de depreciative conversations and then at the end you got statement-based versus inquiry-based. Do you want to touch a little bit about what that graph is and, and how we can go to the top right quadrant, which is about conversations worth having, which are appreciative and inquiry-based? Do you want to talk touch on those four sort of topics? So one of the things I, I like about the, the new book, we got more pictures, more visuals in there. Um, I like pictures. Visual, I like visuals. It's, it's good. Of, it's like one of the second visuals. And imagine your axis going um, appreciative, and depreciative and statement and inquiry. So those are your axes. And, and what we want is, um, I'll, let's start with what we don't want, but below the line is depreciative conversations. And, and if you're making a statement and I'm making a statement and it's depreciative, I don't value you, you don't value me, and there's no questioning going on, it's just advocacy and statements, those are destructive conversations. And we don't wanna be there with people. And, and in the next quadrant, we can say these are critical conversations because it's depreciative, but I'm, I'm saying, well, it's, you know, who said that? And that was wrong. But you begin to ask questions that um, are very critical. Why would you ever think of doing that, Michael? You should know better. So those places that are depreciative, over time, critical conversations will put you in that destructive box. And, and what we want to do is get you 
above the line again into that appreciative space. And, and an appreciative conversation can be affirmative where I say something nice about, I really like your report. And you thank me and you say, well, I really like this about you, Jackie. And it's, we're not really moving forward because we're not asking questions about, well, why do you really like that? And how might I do that better? And what else? So we want to move you into that top right-hand quadrant, which is a which is a conversation worth having. It's very palpable, but what the thing is, is we're beginning to ask questions to move forward and to learn from and to grow from and create those innovations. Is there anything you want to add on that, Sherry? Thank you for that, uh, Jackie. The only thing that I, w- I would add is um, it might be helpful for, if you're listening to this, um, when the podcast is over, to take a moment and just think about your own conversations and to think... Um, do I do I make more statements or do I ask more questions Um, and ask about do I make more statements ask questions about other people and what about my inner conversations with myself do I tell myself what to do and criticize myself or do I ask myself generative questions Um, And then the other piece would be to say, you know, am I above the line? Am I outcomes focused and um, adding value with my conversations? Or am I really focusing on the negative and devaluing people and places? Um, And if you look at that and kind of assess your own conversations, you'll get an idea of where your conversations fall um, and just try it with some different people where where are my conversations with my partner, with my kids, with my coworkers, with myself? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. And what I think conversations really boil down to as well. I think individually, we're all trying to work out the world and work out our life. And one of the ways we do it is externally verbalizing what we're thinking, what we're feeling, and asking for feedback. And generally speaking, we we go out there trying to you know, trying to put the pieces together and say, I'm working on this or I'm doing that or this is how I feel or I'm not too sure how you think or how you feel. We sort of get our conversations very entangled with our, you know, making those statements and we were so busy making statements that if we took the time to actually say, okay, where, where, whereabouts are you coming from with this? And you're, in, you're curious and leaning into why do you think this way? Why do you feel this way? What is your vision on this? And understanding, understanding purpose. I think... This is why sort of long-term relationships, people sort of get to the point where they know their deepest, darkest sort of visions and they know where they're going. But this is where conversations can sort of get really mixed up because we just keep speaking on statements and never, as you said, are you having more conversations above the line or below the line as well? Um, and we really need to get into balance to stop, pause, reflect, breathe and realize, hang on a sec, we are in control of our words and our conversations and... Um, just to talk about above the line and below the line, just some of the notes I got was above the line things are positivity, uh, critical thinking, creativity, and open-mindedness as well. And then below the line, these are things like judgment, blame and shame, toxicity, and closed-mindedness as well. Um, Yeah, jumping into sort of the second dimension in the book, you say conversations are either inquiry-based or statement-based, or we're either asking questions or we're making comments. Um, Can you talk a little bit about sort of that and how such questions build relationships, connections, and and awareness that add value to appreciative uh, in nature? Um, Jackie, question for you. I, I think when you ask questions about tell me what you think, um, how did you, like Sherry mentioned earlier, generative question is, where have you done this before? Or even if we know that we want to talk about a peak experience, can you can you share a peak experience, a time where communication in this department was really connective and we knew what we were doing? Because um, we know what we're doing wrong, typically when we come to a meeting on communication that we have to improve, asking questions about what would this look like if we were communicating well? What would this look like if our conversations were very um transparent and, and it's, it's trying to move you into what you want more of not what you don't want um i'll ask you some personal questions i mean what sort of tips or tricks or things you would you would teach sort of husbands and wives and partners and boyfriends and girlfriends and whatever they are um to improve the conversations in in the in the marital household oh what a great question um i could um 
give you one from my own experience, uh, which is in our second edition of the book. Um, I, uh, in my, um, with my husband and my family, um, I tend to offer my opinion, even if it hasn't been asked for. <laughs> um, and I'll make suggestions about ways that I think something could be either more efficient or better or whatever. Um, and I'm aware of that and I know that it's irritating. And after sort of, after this book, um, the first edition was published, I was walking the dog with my husband one morning and he was telling me about um, a conversation he had had with a, a young man that he mentors. Um, and my first thought when he was describing what he had said, because it was somewhat critical of the young man, inside I was like, why would you say that to him? Why? Um, and and I, I just paused. I was like, pause, take a breath. And in that breath, and the pause, breathe, and get curious doesn't have to take very long. It probably took about 12 seconds for me to pause take a breath and and ask, am I adding any value by giving him my opinion? And the answer was no, he had already had this conversation. He was simply sharing it with me. And so I didn't say anything, I let him finish. And then I asked a question to, um, to help me understand why he had said what he said, which is what I was, I was gonna negate, but I didn't. But I, so I asked, you know, what was your thinking about that? And when he shared why he said what he said, um, it was like, ah, oh, that was a, that was a really valid reason. It was a good, um, I, his decision was a good decision. And so that, that was this whole piece of um, not assuming that I know better um, which I think in relationships, um, I know I am not alone because I've heard many, many men and women friends of ours where the women are very similar and the men are very <laughs> similar in their relationships. So I would say just pausing and not being so quick to, um, to make assumptions. I mean, I, there, my judgment was coming from an assumption. When I checked it out, it was not accurate. So, and same thing with your kids. We're trying to help, um, and instead we don't listen. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the biggest issues. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, what I got from that was, uh, yeah, don't assume and don't react. Uh, ask more questions to find out more information. So can you can tell me why? And I think that's, that's a really good sort of um, – and that's having the space to say – who's in the driver's seat, and that's tuning into the conversation. Instead, we tune out of the conversation, get ready to respond what we want to say, and we don't really listen, and we're not too interested as well. So I think being interested and curious is great. Uh, is there any tips you want to add, Jackie, with um, sort of personal relationships on how can we improve our conversations? I'm going to add a piece of research for if there's any skeptics out there, um, and it's the one about relationships, but there was a study by Gottman, and he listened for 15 minutes to 700 couples and was able to predict in 10 years with 94% accuracy who was divorced and who was married. And the ratio he came up with, positive to negatives, was a five to one, positive to negative. So what this means, for every negative you say to a significant other, I always look at it, it's going to take you five positives to crawl out of that hole that you put yourself in. And um, it's interesting because Barbara Fredrickson builds on that work and she says you need a healthy unbalance of positive to negative. And, you know, and she recommends a ratio of three to one. And she says, and when you're at three to one, you really need to think about how you're framing. And again, the tone and direction of your of your conversation. So there's lots of um, research behind this. And, and Sherry and I advocate in the book, it, we call it, it's not magic, it's science. We, we advocate like the four to one, 80-20 rule of being in a more positive, appreciative state with people. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? You talk about uh, the difference between it's not magic, it's science. Uh, do you want to, is there anything more you want to discuss regarding the science behind conversations on this? Well, there's like, there's a lot of science out there. And the, the other ratio I want to mention, um, you know, when you're working with high, we want a high performing teams. What I find interesting with the research, it's a six to one positive ratio and then it's a one-to-one this is if you want a high performing team and then it's a one-to-one ratio of inquiry to advocacy if you want a healthy team if you want an unhealthy team it's like three it's a three to one you're making three statements and you're allowing for one question so there's there's quite a bit of science about um not focusing on advocacy all the time and and the other thing that surprises me is self to others that high performing teams again have a more of a balance of focusing on the others to the self so so we kind of highlight the the research out there that um that supports that sure do you want to say more about the brain or anything that i think also for the for those folks who are skeptical um our conversations actually trigger the release of hormones and biochemicals in our body which either support our ability to use our full capacity for thinking, our creativity, our empathy, um, our emotional intelligence, or those conversations shut that down and put us into a fight or flight. Um, And the idea is if you really want, again, for me, back to that maximizing the full potential of, of people and organizations, um, you want people in a place where they can use all of their talents and skills, their creative thinking, um, their capacity to to connect to other people. And they can't do that if they're feeling defensive or shut down or unsafe. And so conversations that generate positivity, um, and that's what this positive to negative ratio is. It's not about being fluffy. It's about on balance generating positive emotions, a positive, a positive state of, of body and mind. Um, so issues that need to be brought up, um, something that needs to be corrected, problems, you don't want to ignore those. These are, this is not about putting on rose-colored glasses. It's about addressing the issues, the problems, something you need to critique in a way that doesn't put somebody in the, de- in the defensive and instead it invites them to learn, to grow, to shift, um, to advocate for what they want and figure out how to do that. Yeah, absolutely correct. And I'll circle back to something you mentioned early in the podcast, which is um, getting into sort of state. So what a lot of people don't realize that above the surface, which is visible to all, which is our conversations, and that's behaviors and actions. But what people don't realize is below the iceberg, under the water, beneath the surface, which is our unconscious drivers. And we need to be understand that our resting body mindset is, is below the water, but what comes under that is beliefs. Like what do we believe? Expectations which plays massive in our conversations. The stress, are we under stress? What's our current worldview and assumptions? But most important, what's our emotions and feelings? What kind of state are we at in terms of emotional and feelings? And then you talk about nutrition. Like if you're hangry or hungry and you know, you're not going to have the best conversation if all you're thinking is bad is getting food into your belly. If you've got those unconscious biases where you've automatically, they've triggered off a bias and you've put up your defensive barriers and you don't want to hear because you think you know better, uh, past experiences, which which is huge, but also sleep, rest, and hydration. Uh, I myself wake up a couple hours before my wife and the time she wakes up, I'm fully awake, I'm inspired, I've had a podcast, you know, I want to talk about it and she's like, just go away. So you need to understand <laughs> that. <laughs> Above the surface, yes, our behaviors and actions are one thing, but it's really what is below that surface as well and understanding that your conversations is based mainly on on how you feel and your emotions and everything else that that goes below. Um, Is there anything you ladies want to add on to that or anything I've missed out on? I think you covered everything that could be a reason why why, why you are below the line. I can't think. I think you nailed it all, Michael. And I would ask a generative question will help make all of that visible. So ask if somebody like snaps at you, you know, you could, depending on your relationship, you could say, I'll bet you didn't have lunch. Oh, no, I didn't have lunch. I am so hungry. I've got a candy bar. I mean, all of a sudden 
So instead of snapping back, it's, it's inquiring into what's going on with you, assuming that something below the line is triggering that kind of behavior. You can also be smart about it. If you want to have a serious conversation with someone, make sure that they're, you know, got sleep, they're, um, they're hydrated, they've got food in their belly, uh, they're happy, get them at the wrong time. Like if you, if you go to your boss or your management or whoever your uh, next person in line is or below you at the wrong time, you're not going to have the best conversation. So also be smart about uh, the timing of a conversation, I think is critical as well. Uh, but yeah, moving on, um, one of the, the biggest things which you spoke about before, which I want to expand on is the silent partner in conversation. And that's listening. Talk to me about the importance of listening and how we sort of need to, to tune in and, and how we need to listen deeply uh, to others. I think that's, that's massive. So listening, um, you mentioned this a little while back, Michael, that um, we often listen um, preparing to respond. You know, what are we going to say next? And, um, or we're listening and we're assessing what the other person is saying. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, that's wrong. I make a note of that. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I agree with that. Well, no, no, I don't. And that's all going on in our head. Um, and and because of that, we're listening through our own frame, um, and listening from, in addition, from the way what's important to us. Um, so all that stuff that's below the line influences how we listen. Um, and. For really deep listening, it's to, to work at suspending all of that. You know, pause, breathe, get curious. What am I anticipating? Um, you know, where am I? How do I, how do I get to this place of just presence? Then there are a couple of things you can, you can do in less than a minute, preparing to listen deeply. Um, and one, one is to just ask yourself kind of, okay, what am I feeling? What am I thinking? Um, what do I want to have happen? And how might I like get out of my way so I can be really present? And then the second is kind of a somatic, a thing with your body. Um, where am I in space? Kind of lean forward, lean back, left, right. Get, get yourself centered in space. And then let gravity kind of lower your center of gravity. Um, feel like there's a weight on your shoulders to let them relax, jaw relaxed. And then ask yourself, what if there was just a little bit more, and that's whatever comes up for you, a little more quiet, a little more calm, a little more. And that can take 10, 15 seconds to do both of those things. And then just listen, listen to, to uh, listen for understanding, listen with curiosity, um, listen as if you, you don't know anything, and this person is showing you um, something for the first time. The Chinese have a, a their symbol for um, the word to listen is made up of a number of other symbols, and it's eyes, ears, heart, yourself, and undivided attention. So you're really listening with the whole being with open mind, open heart, and open will. Yeah, thank you for, and I, I, I couldn't explain the Chinese simple on the podcast, but I did see that in the book, and uh, that that's amazing. Um, Jackie, is there anything you want to add regarding the power of sort of listening? And uh, yeah, thank you for, uh, thank you, Sherry, for explaining that. No, I think Sherry, I, th I think um, Sherry said it beautifully. I can't think of anything else to add. Okay, moving on to um, you talk about in the book the the five AI principles. Uh, we'll start with number one, constructionist principle. What what is what is, what are these principles and what is the constructionist principle? That was the first one we started off with. And social construction is our words create our our reality. Um, and so if you're paying attention to your words and there's lots of negative conversations and words going on, I bet you your reality is probably pretty negative or your feelings. So. Um, yeah, social construction. Our words create our reality. Our words, our words, we socially construct the world. And number two, you, you talk about the what is it, similarity principle. Uh, change happens the moment a question is asked or a statement is made. Do you want to expand on that? It's the simultaneity. <laughs> yeah. The simultaneity. It's, Sorry, I, I yeah, read that. Yeah, it's simultaneous that the, um, it's the moment you ask the question change begins to happen in the person. One of, the, one of the things that appreciative inquiry practitioners recognize that when, when they began working in organizations is the questions they were asking actually were the intervention. 
because when you ask people in an organization, you know, what's not working around here? When are you most dissatisfied? In reality, um, employee satisfaction goes down when you ask those kinds of questions. Whereas if you begin to ask questions like, um, tell me about a peak experience working here and what made it that way. And um, tell me about a time you've been most engaged and satisfied in your work and what makes that happen and how might you do more of that. Um, all of a sudden, employee satisfaction goes up or employee engagement goes up. So questions aren't neutral. They always move people in one direction or another. And so if you if you're going to engage in questions and conversations, recognize those conversations are the intervention. Yeah, well said. Um, you know, some of the notes I got from that was also change happens the moment a question is asked. Yeah, but as words are spoken, our mind and body and emotions react in a split second. It's interesting that um, how people's words can affect your state and then how your words can affect someone else's state, whether that be a positive interaction or a negative interaction um yeah our communication skills is probably one of the highest things that is undervalued and, and underspoken about but it has the highest value like our words can hurt our our words can mend and you know what we say matters um which is which is fantastic number three you talk about the poetic uh, principle every person organizational situation can be seen or understood from many perspectives um do you want to uh, expand on that a little bit so the poetic principle reminds me of poetry. A poem has multiple interpretations. And the poetic principle, the way I always look at it is I have a choice. Um, we can talk about what we don't like here and everything that's going wrong and how stressed out we are. Or we could talk about what's going on right here and you know what brings us calmness, what makes us collaborate. So you actually have a choice in what you would like to, to talk about. Yeah. Anything you want to add on that, Sherry? Kind of like where you place your focus is what becomes your reality. If you imagine a, um, you know, you're, you talked about family. If you imagine um, a family member or a child or your partner, um, just think about the difference. If you focus on what's wrong with them, the things you're critical about, you wish they would change, why can't they get that right? And then get it, you get a sense of how you feel about that person or your child. And then, you know, kind of erase that and look at that same person again, but this time focusing on their strengths, the beauty, the gifts they bring into the world, the reason you love them so much, what you're grateful for about them. And all of a sudden, it's a different person and your experience of them is totally different but it's the same person. And that's the poetic person, the poetic principle. Yeah, one of the notes I got from that was there, there's no one truth about any person, uh, situation or organization. Truth depends on perception and focus of attention. So it's, it is really where you put your attention. And um, I find it so, uh, I, I find conversation and, and even truth is so interesting what might seem true to you might seem so wrong to others but what you see so clearly others can't see and even if you try to you know pound people with the facts it doesn't it doesn't really change their perception of what what truth is and that's the world we live in at the moment where everyone has a different perception or understanding there's not one particular truth there's multiple truths and your right can be my right as well and we both can be right in the same time where it's a bit of an oxymoron but anyway moving <laughs> on um you talk about an anticipatory principle the images and thoughts we hold influence our intention and conversation do you want to talk about sort of that as well um either one of you to expand on on that the anticipatory principle Sure. And this is something probably everybody has experienced that we kind of get what we expect in life. We, um, whatever we're looking for, we tend to find it and we miss other things. So being a, aware of what am I anticipating? What do I want to move towards? And how can my expectations help um, both myself, but other people? the team that I'm working on, the organization, other people. How can I hold high expectations for them so that I'm seeing 
when they're at their best instead of holding low expectations. Um, and then, of course, I will see that the poetic principle and the anticipatory principle kind of go hand in hand around that. It reminds me a little bit about the reticulating, activating system where they talk about, you know, exactly what that is, the images and thoughts we we hold influence our sort of intention uh, conversation and the direction on where we're going to put our energy and actions as well. Uh, is there anything you want to add on that, Jackie? Um, I always like to think so. In, at, at my university, in the, I'm in the Buell Management Building at Lawrence Tech, and there's a, a, a bust of Henry Ford, Ford Motor Company, and it says, if you think you can, you can, and if you think you can't, you can't. And, uh, you know, if you anticipate you're going to do great on an exam, you're going to put in all the energy to do great. And if you anticipate you're not going to do well, then you're going to be stressed out. You're not going to know what to do and you're not going to do well. So I think it's very powerful um, to anticipate what is it that you want to see happen? How would it play out and what are you going to do to make it play out in the way you would like it to play out? Yeah, absolutely. And touching on Henry Ford, he, uh, there's one little uh, thing I've got in my head regarding Henry Ford. He was once grilled um, in uh, in court once to show that he was literally uh, an uneducated, dumb man. And he basically, they showed his weaknesses and he said, I don't worry about my weaknesses. I only focus on what I can do and what I can do, I do very, very well. And that actually affords me the luxury to purchase people who can do the things that I can't do. So there's nothing I can't do because I can either know what to do or hire the people who know how to do it as well. So that's one of the smartest uh, compliments I've, I've ever heard Henry Ford say. Anyway, and then the last one, you talk about positive principles, which is the more positive and generative the question, the more positive and long lasting the outcome. So our questions inspire images and imagery compels action. Um, yeah, anything you want to add on to that? You know, I think the positive principle is, is, an, is an easy one. It's a favorite one. It's one of the five principles. And just think, the more positive the image, the more positive the actions you'll put into it, and the more positive the results. And even the, um, the science behind it talks about the pow power of positivity, that you're going to get a lot more mileage and productivity beyond with an employee or even a, a child because you're focusing on what's going on well. Yeah, well said. Um, just a couple last questions before we wrap up and before we run out of time. Um, you talk about scaling up great conversations and the overview of the 5D cycle. So let's expand on the 5D cycle. You talk about define, discover, dream, design, and deploy. Um, yeah, can we expand on the 5D sort of model overview? You know, I think it's it's a cycle, the cycle, the 5Ds. You could literally do this cycle in a five to 10 minute conversation. And we've worked with organizations that have scaled it up and spent a day or a day and a half. And the, the define is really important because that's where we really define if we're gonna bring people into a conversation, what do we wanna have a conversation about? Who do we wanna invite? What the topic, what might the topic be? And there's an organization here um, where I work with um, that it's a very large organization and somebody very high up says you will tell your capability teams there's 1500 employees how they will work together and collaborate but the um, deputy director is really smart he said well what if I brought brought them together and he literally um, choreographed a conversation to discover well where's collaboration already going on and if we were collaborating that's discovery and if we were collaborating dream, what would that look like? Imagine in each of your capability groups, 15 capability groups across the entire enterprise, what does that look like? What's the dream? And then they get very actionable. Then they actually design collaboration from, um, and sometimes we call it prototyping, but what needs to change in the organization so that we collaborate we collaborate more. So what are the policies, the procedures, the way we do business? And that's the design phase. And then the um, fifth one, they call it deploy, they call it deliver, um, they call it destiny. But how will we anchor what we've designed to hit the dream of what we discovered and defined to make this the most collaborative organization possible? And so that's what the five Ds are literally, how do you take people through a conversation so that we have the topic that we want to study more is a more collaborative organization. 
yeah, it's it's super smart, and from listening to that, it makes makes complete sense. It's it's interesting you said about the story, but that one person who understands the model and can ask those particular uh, questions in that sequence can really unlock the real treasure, which is in conversation. Um, Sherry, is there anything you want to add on the five D cycle? No, other other than it's just that piece of. The, the five D's are all about getting very clear on what is it that we want to, we want or we want more of in the organization. And then let's ask generative questions to discover what, what do we already know about that? You know, where is that happening? What can we learn about how, to, what kind of conditions make that possible? And then that dream, what, let's create a shared vision, again, generative questions. And then we have we have the vision of where we want to go, what it's going to look like when we are living that all the time. Let's design the structures, the organization, so it automatically happens. Um, and that process unleashes an immense amount of energy from people in an organization. It's it is always just um, a delight to watch people come alive, get excited, and feel like they own the change that's going to happen in their organization. And I, I just want to, we've had organizations that they create new products, not just processes and systems, but they come up with new product ideas when they're using the 5G cycle. Yeah. Yeah. People are waiting for these open conversations where they can share and have that, that, you know, that safe space where they can talk and they can really nut it out. And it's about, it's about having that understanding as well. So to, to wrap up the conversations, obviously people, what we want them to learn from this conversation is how to develop new conversation habits. So just to wrap up, what are some of the things people can take away from this to start these new conversation habits? Uh, I'll start with you, Jackie. Yeah, if you think of a, the, um, having a conversation worth having, we, we talked about these two two practices, which is generative questions and positive framing. Um, when we talked about these five principles, those are ways of um, what's driving your conversation from the social construction through the positivity. And I like to look at the 5D cycle as a methodology that you can follow if you want to orchestrate and choreograph a conversation with several people in the room and decide, you know, how long do we want to come together to do this? But what's driving every conversation is the way you ask questions and how you frame what it is you want to talk about. Yeah, very smart. And yourself, Sherry, uh, any things you want to add on sort of how to develop a new conversation habit? Um, sure. Uh, be the one driving. So pause, breathe, and get curious. And um, if you really uh, just want a little more information than some uh, ideas about questions on our website. We have a free conversation toolkit. Um, and in that is like a brief summary of the book, but also a list of generative questions, um, questions you can ask your kids, and a, kind of a short video on, on the, uh, the overall power of your conversations. Um, and that's conversations worth having today or just cwh.today. Perfect. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Ladies, thank you for uh, writing the book, all the work you've done. Continue what you're doing. And yeah, thank you for uh, for putting it all out there for the world. And I appreciate your time on this podcast. Uh, for my audience, go out there, uh, check out this book. It is amazing. Uh, again, ladies, thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you, Michael. And, uh, thank you so much, Michael. It's a pleasure. Right, no worries at all. All right, have a great day.